afternoon, everyone. Well done, survivors of the lunch break. Proud of you for being here. That's very good. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, an idea of entrepreneurial investing, and, and really, there's kind of one one key takeaway that I'd like you to sort of take from this. Um, obviously, I'm going to talk about our own approach to entrepreneurial investing, and I hope that, that might give you some ideas, but. Um, I think whether you're, if you're an advisor to wealth, and I know we have a lot of advisors uh, in the room, we did, um, then you really need to be looking beyond the mass market products that are being served by all of the private banks um, and, and other institutions. And if you're a family office or a high net individual, I'd really urge you to encourage your advisors to go out and do some work and find some more unique products, because there are some very good products out there. Uh, I found, as an investor myself, when I went to all the private banks, looking to decide which private bank I would work with, uh, you very quickly discover that there is no differentiation. The only deciding uh, element for me was what sports they sponsor. Which, which one is going to provide the best corporate hospitality? Because otherwise, there's very little to uh, differentiate them. Um, so, quick background on myself, I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years in, in, in grown-up businesses. I actually started my first business as a 12-year-old making ice cream and selling it to pubs and restaurants. I've taken a couple of companies public, written a couple of books on, on various business models. Um, I am officially the World Business Angel Forum High Commissioner for Singapore. Uh, after two years, I've yet to convince either of my children to call me High Commissioner. In fact, I've failed to convince anyone to call me High Commissioner, but it's a very grand title. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, really what I started looking at as an investor myself, and ultimately the investors that we work with, and I guess like minds uh, attract, but we work with a lot of entrepreneurially minded investors and family officers. So typically they come from a small business background, they've made their wealth, and they're now looking to, to invest, but they're looking to invest in an intelligent way. Um, and they're looking for three things. The first one's not very unique, they're, they're looking for alpha, they're looking for great returns. And I, that's not unusual for investors. So they want to consistently outperform the market. Second thing that the investors that we work with are looking for is they're looking for impact. And there was a lot of talk yesterday about impact investing. Specifically in our world, the investors that we work with are looking to impact into small business. So they come from that background. If they're going to invest money into a project or a business, they want that money to go in to help grow the business, not just to go out to another investor or just trade shares. And the third one, which is probably the most important, is liquidity. Now, oftentimes, when you speak to a fund manager, a fund manager will love a 10-year term contract because it means they can put the money in and then they don't need to think for 10 years. But if you're an entrepreneur, if you come from an entrepreneurial background, you're dealing with opportunities every single day. So if you lock your money up in an 8 plus 1 plus 1 private equity fund, for example, the opportunity risk to you is so huge that it negates any upside that you're, or any percentage upside that you're likely to get from that lockup environment. So the risk of missing out on an opportunity means that illiquid investments are very unattractive for entrepreneurial investors. So that's what they're looking for. Um, ideal world, they're looking for that sweet spot between high returns, making a positive impact, and liquidity. So let's look at that a little bit more. If you're looking purely to make impact, um, then I suggest you become an angel investor. There's some wonderful opportunities for angel investors to put money directly into companies uh, and feel very good about yourself and support the ecosystem. But realistically, it's not going to give you a very good return on that investment. Uh, I know there's possibilities. We tend to play probabilities, not possibilities. There are very few Ubers out there, and most uh, angel investors don't get very good returns, and they definitely don't get very good liquidity. Investing in angels uh, in startup companies, it's very, very diff difficult to get your money back out of those. 
Second one is investing directly in the market. In the market, if you want liquidity, invest in the market. You can get your money in and out very, very quickly. That's fantastic. You're not really making a direct impact in the businesses. If you believe in Tesla, buying Tesla shares is great. They get a secondary impact, but the money goes to another investor. It doesn't go into the company directly. Um, and it's very difficult to, over a long period of time, outplay the market. It's very difficult to get more alpha than the market itself. Um, and then the, the last one is if you're really focused on alpha, the traditional model was to, to go to private equity. Private equity done, has done a very good PR job of convincing itself. And we saw yesterday that 68% of family offices still put private equity as one of their primary investments. Um, but even the most uh, hardened advocate for private equity will openly admit that the private equity world is a bit of a bubble at the moment. It's sitting on around a trillion of dry capital. The average uh, price to earnings ratio that they paid for companies last year was 13 times. Um, and if you're paying 13 times versus 6 times about 20 years ago, you have to saddle those companies with a huge amount of debt. Um, you settle those companies with a huge amount of debt and then you pray that interest rates aren't going to go up. That's not a bet that I want to take. Uh, so, and you definitely, uh, even the most uh, enthusiastic PE advocate will admit that for most of the time they have a negative impact on the businesses they get involved in, not a positive impact, and there's certainly no liquidity. Again, most deals are 8 plus 1 plus 1. So how do you get that spot in the middle? Is there anything that is that spot in the middle? Well, there is actually one thing. Pre-IPO stock. If you can get hold of pre-IPO stock, the money typically goes into the business to help its expansion. The minute it lists, you get liquid. And pre-IPO stock consistently outperforms the market. Even allowing for the fact that 50% of all IPOs never go above their opening, uh, their opening number. Over time, over with enough uh, data, you outperform the market. So let's have a look at that. This is based on 25 years of results. You can see uh, down the bottom we have liquidity. 10 years on one end, 10 seconds on the other end. It's probably 10 microseconds actually. Um, and then you have the alpha, the returns on the left hand side. So S&P 500 over 25 years has returned about 10%. Small cap has returned about 30% more than that, but is arguably a little bit less liquid. PE, private equity, despite the, um, uh, again, there was, a, there was a slide yesterday talking about the myth of private equity is 30% returns. Actually, over 25 years, it's averaged 13% returns, and you're locked up for 10 years. If you can get pre-IPO stock and you exit on day one, on average, you'll get a 17.5% return on investment, which is not bad. If you can hang on to it for a year, you get a 23.6% return. So that's kind of a fantastic thing to be going for. And it kind of fits all the criteria for an entrepreneur or investor. Big question is, how do you consistently get access to pre-IPO stock? And the reality is you can't. Uh, there's very few, you have to be a very big, very significant investor or uh, yeah, investor that my time really? um, in one of the investment banks in order to get access to the top stocks you might get a lot of offerings if you're uh, if you're a family office or a high net worth you may find you get a lot of pre-IP offerings but they tend to be at the lower end of the market these tend to be the ones that are a little bit speculative and the reason you don't invest in them is because they're a little bit speculative so it's very very difficult to do it unless you create a model specifically for it. That's what we've done. So this takes a little bit of explaining, but in effect what we've done is we've set up a fund which has a symbiotic relationship with a publicly listed company. That publicly listed company takes about 20 small businesses public every year. And we do it through a reverse takeover. So what happens is the fund invests into a small, illiquid private company in the morning. And we're typically, we're not talking high tech, we're talking old school companies with clients and profits and those kind of things. You remember those ones? Um, so things like education businesses and interior fit out companies and rubber piping makers and those sort of things. So the fund invests money in the, in the company in the morning. 
In the afternoon, that company swaps its private stock for public stock with the public entity. And, the, and so what happens is for the small business, they're now going public without any of the cost or pain of a normal IPO process. Mm. For the public company, they get to announce to the marketplace, okay, we've just acquired a couple of million dollars of EBITDA and three or four million dollars of net cash, and it's cost us nine, ten million in stock, in scripts. So it's all script deals, which is fantastic. There's no other PLCs in the world today that can acquire cash and capital that cheaply. For the fund, this is where it really gets interesting, for the fund, they invested in a smaller liquid company in the morning, in the afternoon they got their exit. So the minute that share price starts to go up on the news, that fund can start to exit its position and reuse that capital into the next, the, the next deal. So in order to understand this very, uh, kind of need to understand the agglomeration, which is the model that the PLC uses. I know some of you yesterday managed to get a hold of this book. We have a bunch of them outside, but they've all disappeared, which means some, but not all of you have got them. Um, if you'd like a copy of that book, just come and give me your business card at the end of today, and I, or the end of this uh, presentation, and I'll give you a copy of that. Um, a collaboration really, in a nutshell, is a diversified investment holding group that allows small businesses to, to take all the advantages of going public. The difference is, we as entrepreneurs believe that those entrepreneurs that take their businesses public should be allowed to stay in operational control of those businesses. So they keep their brand, they keep their culture, they get to run it the way they want to run it, which is very important for entrepreneurs. If you've ever tried telling an entrepreneur what to do, you realize we're not very good at being told what to do, which is why the traditional roll up and list where you try and consolidate everything normally results in all the talent leaving. So in our model, the talent stays because they're in effect taking their own company public. Um, so the one that we're using at the moment, the vehicle that we're using at the moment is the UK PLC. We're listed on the Frankfurt main market. Um, there was a number of reasons for doing that, but I'm flying to Frankfurt tomorrow in the middle of winter, and I'm now beginning to think that that was the wrong market to cho choose. Um, Singapore market is much warmer, but less liquid. Uh, so the MBH business, um, originally MBH stood for multiple business holdings. Someone has rechristened it Mini Berkshire Hathaway because of the, uh, the uh, approach to acquiring companies but letting the, the people run them. Um, we listed on the main market in November. In December, we did our first acquisition. Uh, and basically, we've really announced the market. We'll be doing 15 to 20 acquisitions over the next 12 months. Uh, we have companies in the pipeline in order to do that. It's a very, very aggressive growth. Now, what that means for AVC is I'll give you a real life example, um, although uh, the exit hasn't happened yet. So that's uh, theoretical. So ABC invested in a company called Dubelay Contracts, which is a 16-year-old interior fit-out company in the UK, does fantastic work. They invested half a million in that on December the 6th. Two days later, Dubelay got uh, acquired. I, in my presentation, I said two hours later. It was two days, so we, we were slow, it was a bit disappointing. Um, but two days later, ABC got liquid stock in MBH as opposed to illiquid stock in Dubai. Um, now, ABC hasn't exited yet, but it's expecting to exit around mid-February at around a 50% return. So 50% completely out of the investment within about 8 to 10 weeks. Where that gets really interesting is that that's not where it stops. It's that money, that's 750 now, can be reinvested straight into the next deal and there's a whole pipeline of deals waiting to go through. So when we talk to our investors, we're only asking them to lock up their money for 12 months, not eight years or 10 years or 12 years. So 12 months, and at the end of that 12 months, they can either take cash, they can reinvest, or they can hold stock in the PLC. The PLC is sitting on a lot of net cash and it has, we only acquire debt-free profitable companies, so it's strong EBITDA, strong cash flow, um, EBITDA is a made up number, so we insist all the companies are 50% cash to EBITDA, so it's a strong cash flow, it sits on the cash, 
So it's high dividend yielding stock. So our founders can, uh, so our investors can make a choice on that. So in short, that basically gives them uh, the alpha that they want because you're investing in companies, and these are companies. You know, if you invest in a startup, they're trying to figure out all product market fit. When you invest in a ten-year-old company, they're probably turning away business because they don't have the resource to execute on it. So when you invest in it, it makes a real difference. Um, to me, it makes far more sense to invest in a, a business doing ten million and help them grow to twenty million because they can't do that without adding about 100 headcount. That has a far bigger impact on the economy than investing in a, some guy inventing the next Flappy Birds app in his, in his apartment. However, all the media and all the government focus on tech startups, whereas the SMEs tend to get missed out. Um, so it's having a real impact. The Elf is clearly visible, uh, and the liquidity, it's a one year time frame, uh, but that's not bad. And, and also, if you really want shorter liquidity, you can just invest directly into, uh, into the agglomerations. Um, just a quick word about why we're doing this. We come from an entrepreneurial background. We were, obviously, we were trying to solve a problem for ourselves, but there was a bigger disconnect that really surprised us when we looked at it. 50% of the world's GDP comes from SMEs. Almost 90% of private sector employment around the world comes from SMEs. Yet you've got trillions and trillions of dollars of sophisticated investment capital that can't touch the SME market. The reason they can't touch it is because SMEs are illiquid and they're risky. And so any sensible money is going to stay away from that space, even though it has huge opportunities. So unless there's vehicles like this, which de-risk it through a portfolio approach and give you the liquidity of public markets is very, very different. If you can reconnect that capital to the people that are out there creating the real value and the jobs and, and solving problems, it makes a huge difference. The other thing we noticed when we started looking at our own philanthropy is that the people that are doing all of the really interesting stuff in philanthropy right now are all entrepreneurs. They're all the ones that have gone to, from solving problems in their own businesses, often solving problems in their industry, and once they exit, they look at how they solve problems on a bigger scale. And if you can help more entrepreneurs to solve bigger problems, then I think you actually solve a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of the world's challenges. Um, as I mentioned, if you'd like a copy of the book, just come up to me afterwards, give me a copy of your business card. Uh, this is Richard Branson reading it. To be honest, he put it down straight after this photo, but uh, <laughs> it's, still, it's still a good photo. Um, and uh, that, that's it for me. If you'd uh, like to be in touch about anything, uh, reach out to me on any of these or I'm around for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much.